What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, despite UConn being quarantined and stripping me of my bed in my humble abode there. But we're back with more Dynasty content every single Wednesday. And as always, I'm joined by my man, Mike, at Mike Me Up on Twitter. Mike, nothing is going on at all right now in football, so we're just trying to make the best content we can do. I know you just finished up your 2021 class, so you're already bored of this one, but uh, how's it going? <laughs> what are you looking forward to uh, in these upcoming weeks? The draft is like right around the corner, so I'm pumped up for that. Yeah, man, I'm pumped because at least the draft is freaking happening, man. I think like for a while there, I thought there was like a like a chance that it might be delayed. And now basically they're just going to do the NFL draft on sleeper. It sounds like right all <laughs> virtual. Uh, so you're going to hopefully they show the DMs and see all the stuff is going on. But I'm pumped. At least that's happening. We don't know if the NFL season is going to happen, unfortunately. But, you know, I mean, you got to take the small W's in this time. So I'm pumped, man. I just want to I just want to get this draft going. At this point in the season, you take whatever you can get. Any little hump in the road, you just got to move past it. And, oh, look, the draft is on the way. And OTAs and all this stuff, I have, actually, like, OTAs aren't going to happen. So nothing is really uh, good past the draft for a long, long time. So we got to make this time last. What our goal today is, is to really break down the value of these rookie picks. I know a lot of people go out and say, you know, sell OBJ for the 104, sell so-and-so for whatever. But they don't really tell you, one, like, the difference in tiers, right? Because the 101 – sounds fantastic but how much different is it than the 102 or how different is the 108 to the 202 and i'll give you guys a little sneak peek in our opinions it's not that big so you can use those difference in tiers at least in our opinions uh to leverage trades and be able to get more value while still maintaining similar players in a similar tier so we're going to do that we're also going to look at the top five consensus uh, per adp right wide receivers and running backs and say what we would be willing to give up in terms of this year uh, and future rookie picks just to see uh, where we're testing the waters in terms of how good these elite players really are. And then finally, we're going to go through 1-1 through 1-12 and give a one-for-one -one equivalent for who we would sell the pick for and who we would buy the pick for. So I think it's going to be a really good look at really the all-around aspect of these picks, what, can, what you can expect to get if you keep these picks, as well as what you can give up and get in return. And then lastly, uh, let's plug the Discord. Uh, we're breaking down three trades from the Discord this week. So we chose ones that have rookie picks in them. So we can kind of break that down and look at the values of the guys like Chris Godwin that were included in those trades. But if you guys want to be featured in upcoming weeks of these episodes with trade reviews and just even if you don't want to be in the episode and you just want your stuff broken down by like the 850 members we got in there, a little humble brag, uh, you guys can join that. It's completely free. We got a great community in there that's always starting up mock drafts and actual paid leagues that has a third party to collect funds so you won't get finessed. But that's enough rambling. <laughs> It's time to get to the big facts. So, Mike, what time is it? It's the intro time, baby. Let's go. Yeah, so first off, we're going to do a quick intro on our tiers, and that kind of helps set the base valuation for you guys in terms of what you're looking for. You know, if you go on Twitter and everywhere else, like, you always see people say, like, oh, you should sell this guy, you should buy this guy. But, like, really, if you don't give, like, prices, I think that's, like, not really actionable advice. So we're going to try and give you, like, our tier breakdowns, and then from that, you'll be able to kind of, like, pinpoint values. And even if you disagree with us, you'll kind of be able to work backwards and see, like, how we value those guys and develop your own frame of thinking. So that's kind of what we're trying to go for here. So let's kick it off here. Tier one, me and Noah have it the same. Note, this is for super flex also. So I know oh, yeah, you right. guys do one quarterback leagues, just basically knock out these quarterbacks and put them lower towards the end of the list. I would say just right away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is a super flex league. So kick it off tier one. We're going to go against the grain here. Noah and I both have Jonathan Taylor and Deandre Swift back to back at one Oh one and one Oh two. Uh, probably not conventional wisdom in terms of like, you know, people saying you should always draft quarterbacks first, but, We've already covered why we don't think that's the case. It's just running back to give you much higher upside. And, you know, I think we originally had DeAndre Swift. Both of us had him at 101 at one point. But at this point, you know, it's kind of hard to hard to keep JT out of that first spot. What do you think, Noah? I don't know. I've been hearing rumblings that he's, like, going to go in the third round. I'm not so I sure. hear that, too. That's ridiculous to me. A guy with his size running a 4-3-9, like, he is a better prospect, in my opinion, I think in a lot of people's opinions, than Derrick Henry and obviously – uh, the league is moving in a different direction than it was four years ago. But with Derrick Henry going round two, I don't see how Jonathan Taylor can go much lower than what he went a few years ago. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott went, what, the fourth overall pick just a few years back. Jonathan Taylor yep. may not be quite the same prospect, but he's not far off. So if he gets any type of day one or day two capital, like or, uh, round one or round two capital, 
I don't see how he can't be your 101. I had DeAndre Swift up there because of his pass catching work, but what we've seen in the NFL, guys like Leonard Fournette, who just aren't even efficient or even that good at pass catching or like running between the tackles, are getting so many opportunities because of what these teams are investing in them. And if Jonathan Taylor is a round one or round two pick, I don't see how they don't just funnel him dump offs if it's an offense that is built around that. Even if it's not like, you know, 35 to 40 catches, basically a little bit higher than what Josh Jacobs got last year. Like Josh Jacobs was a locked in RB1 for the good portion of last year when he was healthy. Why can't Jonathan Taylor be that? And I know we said that we have running backs ahead of quarterbacks, and that's unconventional wisdom. But look at startup drafts right now. What quarterbacks are you drafting ahead of a guy like Josh Jacobs? Maybe four or five guys. You have to be really confident that Burrow and Tua are going to return the value of like a Kyler Murray for you to be yeah. willing to take them ahead of a Jonathan Taylor and Swift, who, at least in our opinions, we're very confident are going to be in and around the top 10 dynasty running back rankings when it's all said and done. Yeah, just to jump in on that, like I love Tua. Okay, like I have Tua you know, pretty damn high. Um, but the thing is, like, when I invest in a quarterback, I want someone with, like, Konami code, right? And that's the reason why I don't have any quarterbacks ahead of running backs this year. Like, look, if, if Kyler Murray was there, I would definitely take Kyler Murray because, you know, he's got that rushing upside. But the ceiling just isn't there for your traditional pocket passers, in my opinion, on average. Like, on average, like, it's a very realistic scenario that Joe Burrow turns out to be, like, you know, a better version of, um of jared goff right and are you really taking jared goff like ahead of guys like jacobs even sanders or on the upside if taylor and swift hit like you're talking about the kamaras and the chubs of the world like no personally i'm not doing that so that's kind of how where we're coming from in terms yeah of and i think of it this way mike run or quarterbacks that can run are like running backs that can catch they give you that additional floor that you may not oh, i just see you moving two and burrow right now uh they give you that <laughs> additional floor week to week that sure Joe Burrow can be really good with his arm. And I think he's an underrated runner, but is he ever going to be a guy who's rushing 500, 600 yards as giving you what the extra 40, 50 rushing yards a week that makes up for lack of touchdowns. He could be a very, very good NFL quarterback, but even Aaron Rodgers, who we've seen recently, who is a good NFL quarterback, isn't doing much on the ground. Like he's a back end QB one most weeks. Uh, and as you said, right, when you can get a guy like a Josh Jacobs type, uh, hopefully turn into maybe a Nick Chubb, what we see in Jonathan Taylor, like, you're taking that over a back-end QB1 any day of the week, even if it's super flex, because when, when it comes down to it, after like QB8 or 9, the difference from QB8 and 9 to like QB18 isn't all that big week to week. So I'd much rather take uh, a more scarce position, one that you can't really rely on as many guys week to week, and a guy like Jonathan Taylor and a guy like DeAndre Swift. We have those guys in a tier, so maybe if you are in trade talks and you want the 101 and his price is too high, just shoot for the 102 instead because I would be willing to say most leagues are going to be going for a quarterback with the 101 yeah. or 102. So you can leverage that and maybe even get Taylor at the 102, maybe even at the 103. So I think that's a huge value play if the guy at the 101 is valuing that pick super highly, which he probably should because it's hard to acquire. Um, but yeah, to, like if, if you can't get that, that's just an easy swap to go down to the 102, get a little bit more in return or even the 103, 104. I know it's below tier for us but I think what you can see in consensus is quarterbacks are usually a bit higher so you might be able to uh, pay down a little bit even more and get a running back if that's what you want to do with your draft yeah not in the big dogs league though people know what's up in big dogs discord oh, yeah. they're not taking draft Josh, 101. So it's just 109 <laughs> in our league. So. yeah all right well tier two we got the top quarterbacks uh Noah's got a burrow to a, I got a to a burrow you know they're in the same tier I just like to a more as a prospect uh coming in but Honestly, you can't go wrong with either of the guys here. Um, not not too much to add here. I mean, there's nothing nothing worth throwing in there that's kind of out of the ordinary. But yeah. if you're sitting I will at say the if two goes to the Chargers, he might be my oh, one yeah. here. Because, Ooh. I mean, he's surrounded with so many weapons. I know Burrow is too, but A.J. Green is one foot out the door, and that organization is trash. And I know the Chargers organization is pretty <laughs> trash too, but just not this past year. 2018, Phil Rivers was very good for fantasy, and Tua at this point of his career, even with one hip, is a million times better than Phil Rivers and his 15 kids. Yeah, for sure. The next tier kind of get a little different here. So we got Noah going at 105, Cam Akers, 106, J.K. Dobbins. And that's kind of the end of the running back tier for him. I have it the same rank with Akers and Dobbins, but I put C.D. Lamb in that same tier as well. Um, so that's just a little bit different. I think that, you know, Lamb is kind of the best wide receiver. You know, as you kind of see from this, like we really heavily invest in running backs at the top. Um, just because like we've done our ranks and I mean, Noah can speak to this too, but the wide receiver depth is, is so talented. Like I can, I can literally name off about 25 
to 20, 25 to 28 probably wide receivers that I'd be comfortable starting as my wide receiver one. Like, what are your thoughts on that, Noah? A hundred percent. We went through it last week, I think with Nick and we weren't trashing Terry McLaurin when we said he's like our wide receiver 29 or 30. It's just so deep when DJ Chark, Calvin Ridley, Tyler Boyd, Michael Gallup, all these guys who are perceived as wide receiver twos, when you go through your rankings and you see that they're closer to like mid wide receiver threes, just because of the talent at the position, like I'd a hundred percent take a running back over those guys because in round six, seven, eight in a startup, you can get receivers that are going to return a ton of value, be probably wide receiver twos during the season. And you're going to be able to pair that with a solid running back by fading position early. The only reason I don't have lamb in here is kind of what Mike was alluding to. Like, I would much rather invest in a running back who I believe in their talent. And I'm a little bit lower on Dobbins than most. But if the capital is there, as it seems like it may be with, you know, his pedigree and what he did these past few years at Ohio State, I have a better feeling. And I think he has a better chance of increasing his value year one to year two than C.D. Lamb, who is a rookie receiver. We know that there are sometimes struggles. I know 2019 was a bit of an outlier, especially if the coronavirus takes up all these OTAs and stuff, which we'll be getting to in the narrative. But I just feel a little bit more comfortable investing in running backs. Now, if one of these backs goes round three or four and Lamb is like a top 15 pick, uh, I'll probably move him ahead of Rager and then into this tier as well. I'm pretty sure that's what you're maybe assuming with your tiers right now. So we're not too far off. Don't get twisted by the colors. But like, uh, yeah, all these guys right here, everybody inside like the 110, in my opinion, I think are locks to be very, very valuable fantasy assets. Yeah, for sure. I, I, and you kind of touched on it. I'm kind of building in a little bit of anticipation where, you know, we have these top four running backs, right? But they're, they're not all going to get immediate jobs. So depending on where they're landing, like, you know, I think CD Lamb's a little bit less uh, landing spot dependent. So that's kind of where I have them. And again, like this stuff's going to change once we have the draft. But this is like our pre-draft talent evaluation. And, you know, obviously post-draft, you have to take into account draft capital, especially for running backs because, like, opportunity is king. So I'm sure you'll see a different version of this, but we kind of want to give you a little insight into how we think about things so you can kind of take on those deals and kind of jump ahead of the curve before, before all the DC information comes in. 100%. And then our next year is basically the same. I mean, we almost have our receivers in the exact same order. I just have my receivers in a tier below. We both have uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire at the 110. He is also a very good running back, somebody who is very, very good in the passing game. And I'm not so sure if there's any truth to this. Well, I guess we'll see in a few weeks, but like Clyde Edwards Hilaire is being talked up more than Jonathan Taylor, which is crazy (laughs) to me. But with that type of regard, if he goes like round two, he'd have to move up my board because he's basically just David Montgomery, who isn't trying to bounce every single run to the outside. And even David Montgomery, like he was terrible last year, but he was still usable on quite a few weeks. Yeah. And he had one of the worst landing spots in the league. But this is Let's just lift off the names real quick. Uh, so 107, Noah's got it. Jalen Rager, C.D. Lamb, Jared Judy. So his tier one wide receivers plus Clyde Edwards-Alaire. And then I have it, Jalen Rager, Jared Judy, and Clyde Edwards-Alaire. So very similar. Yeah, you can't really go wrong. I think this is where like the biggest tier break is. I think the top four, and then that's like one big tier with smaller tiers within it. And then 105 to 110 is another big tier with two small tiers within it. And then after that, I think it just it's a pretty big drop off just because I think these other wide receivers have better profiles and are going to have higher draft capital than the rest of the receivers that we're going to name, except maybe Henry Ruggs. And I think these running backs just really set them apart. Uh, These running backs are really set apart from, you know, the Zach Moss is the world who run like they have two torn hamstrings. So yeah, this this is what we're into right now. And then we'll jump into our next tier. Yeah. So you want to kick it off with yours because yours is a little bit different. So why don't you walk through yours and then I'll kind of go through mine here. Yeah, so to wrap out the first round, I have the 111 and 112 as Justin Jefferson and Denzel Mims. I am very high on both of those guys. They're really surprised at the combine. I just think that they're really good players. They have good prospects, yada, 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 whatever. 201, I have Henry Ruggs. I did give in to Henry Ruggs. I'm getting a little bit higher on him just because I'd be lying if I said I'm not petty and I'm not just going to move him higher because so many people hate on him at this point. (laughs) Uh, So, Bush, you win that argument. 202, I have Titty Higgins, fan favorite. 203, (laughs) Justin Herbert. This is like again being pity or petty if the chargers take justin herbert like he's just off my board like i do not <laughs> want to see him succeed which might not sound good and it's probably not good advice to give out in a podcast that people want to listen to uh but then i have brian edwards and antonio gibson gibson is a little iffy because we don't really know what he's going to be in the nfl whether it's a Debo samuel type a ty montgomery type a cordero patterson i hope not but i think at the 205 I'd like to include one player in there because if it's not him, it's probably going to be an Eno Benjamin. It's probably going to be Zach Moss or some other running back or maybe a receiver that gets a really good landing spot. So I think 111 to 205 for me is a pretty big tier. Now, Mike, yours is a little bit different. 
you have quarterback a bit higher. Why don't you jump into that? Yeah, so at the one eleven, I have Justin Herbert, and, he, and you know, I'm not I'm not the biggest Justin Herbert fan, but by all accounts, like a lot of these NFL talking media heads have him ranked above Tua because he's big and he's durable and yada yada yada. And John you know, to, is drooling right. Yeah, now. to us that sounds stupid, right? But at the end of the day, like we're not making the decisions; they're making the decisions. So if someone invests like a top three or even some people are talking about potentially Justin Herbert going at 101 right so if he gets that kind of draft capital you know he's a guaranteed starter so in Superflex, you just kind of have to you just kind of have to click the button there like I, I have a personal rule where like even if I don't like the quarterback if they get that high capital I'm not letting them fall out of the first round so that's kind of like where I landed with Justin Herbert like I noticed you have him at uh 203 you know like what if he goes like top five, like or top three? Like, are you still going to hold him there below guys like Mims and and Rugs? Let's say Mims goes in like the round second round, and T. Higgins goes in the second round. Like, are you still hesitant to move Justin Herbert up there? No, I'm not at all. This is I'm trying to speak things into existence. I have no problem moving him to like the 111 or 112. He does have quite a bit of rushing upside. I mean, he's pretty quick. He could be like a Blake Bortles yeah. type who is sneaky, like 400, 500 rushing yards a season. Probably, I actually, I comp to him in the draft guide because he's just a big arm guy that doesn't know how to actually throw the ball. But yeah, I'm not opposed to that if he goes top five, top six. I was joking about the Chargers, but and that situation is just meant for him to succeed, except, especially with what they've done on the offensive line and the weapons that they have. So I'd have no issue probably even moving him into our green tier just because, like, a guy like Danny yeah. Dimes, who a lot of people didn't believe in the talent last year, was given the opportunity to produce and had similarly had the ability to run on the ground. And that's a big part of fantasy these days is having that built-in floor so yeah I'm not opposed to that right now this is just like a little hater play right now so I'm <laughs> I, yeah. I'll admit that yeah I pivoted real quick as soon as I saw Daniel Jones get the sixth round sixth overall pick mm -hmm. uh, you know I was like dude this guy sucks but at the end of the day like he's gonna get a start and then when I started looking into his upside and then started like mapping out the type of weapons he had that's when I kind of made a full circle and you know I think one of the, my favorite trades last year was I traded um Matt Ryan for Daniel Jones and uh, a 2021st and that 2021st ended up being like a mid-round pick and now if you look at ADP Daniel Jones is going like two rounds ahead of Matt Ryan so big big it's big for it's big to get with some of those guys and Justin Herbert is pretty athletic right like I was actually shocked he's 6'6 236 pounds he ran a 468 which is like a 91st percentile speed score so the guy's got some wheels so the upside could te could definitely be there on the rushing side so that's kind of where I'm coming from there next up I got Justin Jefferson love him um, but he's just like that second tier of wide receiver. Maybe he moves out of the first tier, depending on where he goes. Um, but definitely that's a, that's a big dog favorite. And then obviously fan favorite, Titty Higgins, kind of rounds out my tier here. So that kind of brings us to the 201. So I have three players in this tier. And then whereas Noah has one big tier, I kind of have another split. And then in that split, in the following tier, I have Denzel Mims, Jalen Hurts, absolutely love Jalen Hurts, Brian Edwards, Henry Ruggs, and Antonio Gibson. And the reason why I have a group like this is because I think all these guys have a couple of question marks that, that are not answered. You know, Denzel Mims, he had that super down year um, as a junior, and then he's a senior, so he's not even an early declare, which is something that I actually look for. Uh, Jalen Hurts, I love his rushing upside, but the question there is draft capital. If you were to tell me Jalen Hurts got drafted in the first round, I would be comfortable taking him ahead of Justin Herbert. But how do you feel about that, Noah? Ahead of Justin Herbert, I would take him maybe 107, 106. I mean, the ability that he has on the ground alone is going to give you back-end QB1 numbers. Like, Lamar Jackson wasn't throwing the ball at all in 2018, and you could slot him in as a QB1 every week just because he's giving you 70, 80 yards on the ground. I am not saying Jalen Hurts is as good of a player as Lamar Jackson, but rookie Lamar isn't what MVP Lamar was. And even if Hurts is 80% of rookie Lamar, that's still a very valuable fantasy asset. And he can grow from year one to year two and make a pretty substantial jump and learn coverages, learn how to actually throw the ball and uh, be an all-around quarterback and give you that throwing upside along with his legs. So, yeah, I'm, I'm completely fine moving ahead of Herbert, who we also think has rushing upside, but he's not a real weapon on the ground. He's not really going to make too many men miss in the open field. He just has that physique and that straight line speed. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of rounds out our tier. Um, we, we both extended it to Antonio Gibson because he's a fucking god and we love him. That's a big dog favorite. Really, really hoping he gets draft capital um, because if he does, I'm going to own him on every single team. But that's kind of how we round up the tiers. I think from here, what we're going to do is we're going to first take a look at uh, some of the top assets and how we value them. Um, and then we'll go into the one-on-one -on -one player comparison. So I'm just going to read off real quick. Top five ADP per DLF as of March. RB1, CMC, RB2, Saquon Barkley, no shockers there. Uh, RB3, Ezekiel Elliott, RB4, Kamara, RB5, Dalvin Cook. 
on the wide receiver side, we got Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, uh, New Hopkins, Tyreek Hill, and Juju Smith-Schuster. So, you know, let's kick it off here with, with the top dynasty asset. And I, I don't know if, you know, if I'm in the minority here. I know a lot of people love Mahomes and Superflex. But for me, it's an easy decision for CMC at 101. The point advantage he gives you is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I'm still kind of shocked because, you know, going in the offseason, we still have people saying stuff like, you know, I'm looking to sell high on CMC. I'm looking to sell high on CMC because he's kind of hitting that AJ Pex. Like, I don't see it that way. You know, yeah, I see that's a like bold a- move, Cotton. We'll see how that pays off. He <laughs> catches 120 balls again. Yeah, he's, he's 23 years old. He's only a few months older than Barkley. So he was incredibly young when he joined. And, you know, this guy was averaging 29 points a game. Okay. This is the, mar- this is the modern day Marshall Falk. And to give you an example, uh, a sense of how good Marshall Falk was, he, had, he didn't have his best seasons until his, he was age 25. And then he went on and dominated for four straight seasons. So selling early on assets like this, I just don't really get it, um, especially you know, in their prime. And if you're trying to win, like, I get everyone wants a longevity argument, like you know, Mahomes lasts longer, you know, uh, wide receivers are less injury prone. But at the end of the day, like, in a given season, you, you got to score the most points to win. Right? Like, what's your take on that, Noah? I'm 100% on board with you. I'm 100% in the minority in thinking CMC is the 101. I remember Nick had texted us about a trade. I'm not so sure the players, but I'll make up two names who I think it may have been. It was like Josh Jacobs and maybe Allen Robinson for CMC. And I looked at the per game numbers and obviously things change year to year, but CMC averaged like 29 points and those two combined averaged like 33. So he is basically putting up the price, or the value of two ones, like an RB1, a wide receiver one in one roster spot. You could throw yeah. McCole Hardman in your flex and get the same value of a CMC and Hardman as those other two guys that I mentioned. But yeah, I'm 100% on board with you. I mean, we remember back to last year, Cam Newton played what, like two games? He had no elbow. He had no foot. He couldn't do anything. Then Kyle Allen comes in. He's an absolute fraud. Then Will, Will Greer comes in. He is the biggest fraud these <laughs> two eyes have ever seen. And he still did what he did, put up a historic season. Next year, they get Teddy Beanwater, who's like, terrible they have a terrible offensive line but I mean what he did this past year is absolutely incredible I have no doubts that maybe he doesn't repeat it again but he's a threat to catch over 100 balls he's a threat to rush for a thousand yards like there is literally no downside to CMC's game when you saw what he did last year in the face of that and this whole segment it really pained me to put down what picks I would trade him for because I own him in a few leagues and writing down these these picks really made me nervous because Scott owns every pick and I know he's gonna be throwing these offers at me and I'm gonna be looking like an idiot because I'm gonna decline them but going first uh the picks that I put down that I would hypothetically trade him for uh I probably wouldn't push the button but I think this is a fair value is the 101 the 102 and the 105 so going back to our list for me that would be Jonathan Taylor DeAndre Swift and one of the Cam Akers or Dobbins picks I think you know that I believe in Jonathan Taylor's talent I believe in DeAndre Swift's talent if they return the value that I think that they can as top 12 dynasty running backs, uh, that's, that's a pretty good return. Getting the 105 on top as just a safety play and a J.K. Dobbins, if he lands in a good spot, I think is also a very good uh, way to leverage that and get more safety on your side. But even then, like, I'm very hesitant because the, the chance that one of them busts, if the 101 of Jonathan Taylor becomes a Jeremy Hill, if he becomes an Amir Abdullah, like, you, are, you are screwed because you, ha- you gave up the best fantasy asset for a bum and then two shots in the dark. Yeah, this is my approach to CMC, okay? If you're a contender and you, like a strong contender, you like better fucking buy a plane ticket and survive coronavirus and come over here and kick me in the balls for me to consider trading CMC. Yeah. There's no way you're taking I'll take my- you up on that, Mike, because I want <laughs> CMC bad. Um, but look, look, if CMC lost 20% of his carries, 20% of his targets, and 20% of his TDs, so if you cut everything by one-fifth, and you assume the same uh, yards per carry and yards per target, he still would have been the running back one by 58 total points. Like, just, just like that's 3.6 points per game more than the, the next closest running back. Just like try and grasp that around your head and then think about why you'd want to sell this guy. So I'm kind of very much in the same boat as Noah. If I sell CMC, it has to be for an outsized return where the way I think about it is I need to get the value where if I miss on one of those picks, I can still retain like CMC's value. So that's, that's how I built it, right? So I said, I need at least two top four picks in Superflex. I need a mid-2020 first and a 2021 first. So if I bust on one of those top four picks, I still have a chance with the mid and the 2021 first to kind of recoup some value. Uh, whereas if I just take three picks and one of them busts, like you just have no chance of hitting CMC's value. That's kind of how I approached it. 
Yeah, and I think the takeaway here is you're not selling CMC because most people probably aren't going to give you this offer. And I'm completely fine with just walking away from trade negotiations saying, hey, I'll just keep the best running back we've seen in the past few years in terms of fantasy value if you're going to not offer me what it's worth to give him up. So, yeah, I'm completely on board. Same with Saquon Barkley. I did the 101, the 102, and I moved it down to 107, so jumping down a tier. So basically Taylor Swift and like a C.D. Lamb or if you like Clyde Edwards-Alaire and he gets a good landing spot, something like that. I know Mike has the same view on him as CMC, and yeah. they're very, they're basically the same exact player. Uh, Barkley was, he, he, public perception on him is like he fell off, but he also had a high ankle sprain, and he was fantastic down the stretch. He is super young. He is super talented. He's one of the best running back prospects we've ever seen. He can do it through the air, on the ground. Uh, I have no apprehension in buying Barkley at this price, selling him at this price. Yeah, maybe I wouldn't do it, but you know, he's, he's a locked in top two asset for me in a startup draft. I would take him one or two. Yeah. I have him in the same tier and you know, I'm in another league where I was able to draft Barkley and someone offered me CMC straight up for Barkley. Right. And um, I'm at a place where like, when I have someone in the same tier, I kind of just stick with where I'm at. Cause in, in the off chance that I'm wrong and Barkley exceeds CMC this year, like I just, I just kind of want to have that um, kind of have both those players there. So I kind of turned down the trade, but I'm I'm very much in the same boat. Like you have to offer me the same thing that you offer for CMC as Barkley, even though he's maybe a little bit scoring down. But I'm really hopeful for him because, you know, with Joe, uh, with Judge uh, going in the uh, head coach, you know, he's kind of that you know, ground and pound, establish the run philosophy. And then you got Jason Garrett, who obviously came from Ezekiel Elliott to another extremely talented running back. So I'm pretty hopeful for Barkley's volume. I think it's in, I think it's wheels up for him this year. Yeah, and he produced in face of terrible offensive line play and like. Eli Manning, who wasn't great during Barkley's rookie year. So yeah, he's just a locked in stud. Now, this is where it kind of drops off for us. We personally yep. don't have Ezekiel Elliott as high as consensus. I think he's probably my running back five or six in dynasty. And because yep. of that, the picks that I would trade him for kind of drop. I, I would go 101 just to play it safe. Like Mike was saying earlier, if you miss, you still have another chance at it. So I'd go 101 and 108. So that's still in that CD Lamb tier. So I can get a guy like JT and I can get a guy like Lamb. And Mike, this might sound crazy but I would put it at like a 50, 50 shot that next year, Jonathan Taylor is being picked higher than Ezekiel Elliott in startup drafts. That's spicy. And I love it. I, I, I can totally see it happening too. Um, depending on where he lands, of course, I, I'm very similar to you. I also have Kamara and cook ahead of Zeke. Um, I'm a little bit worried about McCarthy. Like Zeke is still a fantastic asset. Like he's going to be an absolute baller and workhorse. Um, but I'm just like a little bit concerned because I don't really know what's going to happen. So whenever you have those question marks, obviously you bump it down a little. I have Matt basically the 101 plus of any mid 2020 first, like mid to late first. And if you can squeeze out a second, if not, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And the thing about Ezekiel Elliott too, is like, we've just seen David Johnson and Todd Gurley just vanish, turn into dust. And you might say, oh, but Ezekiel Elliott is so much better of a player. Is he? Do you remember how good Todd Gurley was two, three years ago when he got that bag and how good David Johnson was two or three years ago when he got paid? Like Ezekiel Elliott is fantastic, but is he that much better of a player in the NFL as these other two guys? He's not somebody that I'm adamantly trying to sell, but I'd much rather try to get rid of him this year than wait and see what happens next year. Because if he does have that down season, what's to say that his value doesn't go to a mid a startup mid second round pick? Or what's to say that the Cowboys don't try to move on from him and he's not in a plush situation? And on top of that, I believe Travis Frederick is retired. So that's a big part of their yeah. offensive line gone. And with this whole coronavirus thing, like an underrated aspect is offensive line continuity. I know it's like whatever talking heads are saying all this stuff. But like if these offensive linemen don't have time to work together, an underrated part of the game, what are the chances that the Dallas Cowboys offensive line is going to maintain from what they were last year when they had that, you know, that former all pro in the middle holding down the trenches like a lot of things could go wrong, especially with McCarthy going in there. Sure, maybe he gets peppered with targets, but what if his efficiency on the ground dips? So there's there's a few red flags. Ezekiel Elliott, I'm yeah. not I'm not trying to sell him like crazy, but still like there's there's enough red flags for me to try to move off and maybe get a Jonathan Taylor in return. Yeah, yeah. Next up, Alvin Kamara, one of my favorite players in the NFL. I think it was probably in like episode two or three where we put the big dog stamp of approval to buy on him. And, you know, he like he's just great, right? Like every year so far, he's at 81 targets. Last year, you know, people are kind of down on him because he got hit with some incredibly bad TD variants. We covered that already. Um, but also he had the high ankle sprain. Like we know that high ankle sprain is no joke because if, as far as I'm concerned, if you take down Saquon Barkley with an injury, 
that injury is no joke. I'm going to take that injury incredibly seriously going forward. That's a good way to put it. That dude's a freak. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. What what would you, what would you be looking for, uh, for Alvin Kamara in terms of rookie picks? It's the same as you, uh, two top five picks. I just put 101 and 104 because 101 is that one tier and the 104 is the end of tier two. So I would just basically need a JT and then either a choice of a quarterback or DeAndre Swift. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So don't sell him for cheap. Uh, I know, in, in fact, you know, I see some people thinking about buying him or, or sorry, thinking about selling him for just like one pick. If you have people in your leagues doing that, definitely capitalize. Even if you have to give like a 101 plus like, you know, a second round pick or 101 plus another player, like I'm smashing that all day because Kamara's a stud, right? And his situation is still excellent. People are worried about Drew Brees and I get it. But even with uh, Teddy Bridgewater, Kamara was balling, right? The only difference was that he didn't get TDs. Um, but even in those games, like you're still getting a lot of receptions. Um, and now like he even tweeted out, like he's hundred percent healthy and good to go. So, you know, if Kamara's healthy, um, I'm all aboard. I love that guy as a player. And that offense is built around a pass catching, not built completely around a pass catching back, but I can't remember the last time that they haven't had one, whether it's yeah. uh, Reggie Bush, whether it's Pierre Thomas, whether even Mark Ingram was getting used in the passing game, freaking like Travaris cadet at one point was Aaron being- Sproles. Yeah, Darren. Oh, fucking love that dude. But like Alvin Kamara has just proven to be a touchdown threat. And this year, sure, his play did drop off inside the goal line, but he did deal with that high ankle sprain. I remember putting out a tweet sometime in the season, like his yards per touch from his rookie year up until his ankle sprain was like six point something. And then after that, it was like four point something. It's like, there's no coincidence. He didn't just become shit like halfway through his third year in the league. Like there are some confounding variables. So yeah, I'm completely in on him. I'm also completely in on Cook. Uh, He's somebody kind of like an Amari Cooper who... When you say the name, I'm like, uh, do I want him? And then you go through your <laughs> rankings and you're like, ooh, I want him. Like he's he's a fantastic player. He's in a really good situation. I know Stefanski is gone, but they still have Kubiak, I believe. So they're going to be running yeah. the hell out of the ball. That's just Minnesota's MO is just run, pound the rock, whatever. He is fantastic on the ground. He was used heavily in the passing game. I would want the 101 and the 106. So a little bit less than Kamara, but still 106 nets you that second running back that is that uh, that floor play to get a guy like Akers paired with the Taylor, just in case one of those two busts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if Cook didn't have any injury history, like we could be talking about him as the 101, 102, right? Like 100%. Let's see. Last year, he, let's see. he had that one run in preseason where it was like an 80 yard run. I'm like, I do not remember this being <laughs> Cook. And then I watch highlight videos and they have good music in the background. I'm like, Dalvin Cook is incredible. And I'm just completely <laughs> in on him now. Yeah, he's, a, he's an incredible running back. And, you know, they lost to Fansky, but that. That, that offense is really designed and like driven by Kubiak. So as long as he's there, I'm all aboard the cook train and similar to Noah, if I'm dealing him, I need to at least get back to 101, 102 plus a mid 20, 21st and probably a second or like another smaller piece on top. Because like, like you said, man, like if you, if you bust on one of those picks, like you just literally lost a top 10 asset for nothing. So <laughs> the other thing I would say too, is of these running backs, I think the only one, that we would agree on that we would sell and we're willing to put on the block is Ezekiel Elliott. The other guys, yeah. sure, Kamara and Cook, I believe they're free agents after this year, but they're dynamic in both the passing and running game. So they're not like a Derrick Henry, who's a one-dimensional guy who's just going to get franchise tagged. They help their team in many aspects of the game and they're extremely valuable. So I could see them getting extended for the long term. And they're still super young and you know, Cook has dealt with his injuries, but what he did last year, I think is warranted enough for him to get a big bag. Yep, for sure. Next up, wide receiver one, Michael Thomas had a absolute unicorn year. Um, You basically had a workhorse running back in your wide receiver position, which like never happens. This guy like basically never busted from what I remember. Uh, He was like always performing. And, you know, he's going another year. They added a couple weapons, right? They added Emmanuel Sanders. Uh, Now you have a healthy Alvin Kamara back. Drew Brees is coming back, which is obviously good. But as we saw, even with Teddy Bridgewater, it just did matter, right? MT was a total fucking beast. I haven't been like actually one went up. I remember there was a podcast. Nick said that his numbers went down a little bit. And then somebody in the comments like fact checked him. No shots yeah. at Nick or anything. But like Michael Thomas is just so good no matter who's behind center. And I love to see that out of a player. Somebody who is just situation independent. And they're just, they're just fantastic. They're beasts. So yeah, that's where I'm at with Michael Thomas. In terms of return, I, I put like one one for all these guys just because I like to control the board. And if you don't want Jonathan Taylor when that day rolls around, you have so much leverage to trade it for something. But I would want the 101, the 104. And then I also want the 201. So I think it's about the same value that you have it as two top four, four picks and a 2021 20, first. Uh, the 104 would get you a quarterback. The 101 would get you a running back. And then the 201, you could take a shot at a receiver like a Justin Jefferson, like a Mims yep. if they fall, or even like a Jalen Hurts. Yeah, Michael Thomas is a beast. The only receiver that busted less than him last year was Tyler Lockett. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all over Michael Thomas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, we love him. Uh, he's going to be incredibly hard to buy, I think, especially – with the mindset that some people have, like, you know, 
we value longevity and wide receivers last so much longer and yada, yada, yada. So I, I typically find that a lot of these like top wide receiver assets are almost like untouchable in some leagues. So it's a little bit hard, but if you hold them, enjoy the ride. And if you're in a rebuild and you really need to like sell down those pieces, just make sure you get those top assets back. Um, yeah, he's because, like sneaky yeah. old. He's like 27, but still, yeah. what's that? Like four more years of elite production. And he's like, yeah. can play that big slot perfectly like a Larry Fitzgerald. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy's 37 racking up 1,200 <laughs> yards. Like that's just the <laughs> talent he is. He's fantastic. Yeah, def- definitely. Next up, someone that kind of got lost in the fray this year uh, due to injuries. I'll tell you a really tragic story. I had like a really stacked league where I made a move to give up like Keenan Allen plus some pieces for uh, Devontae Adams but Julie, plus Julian Edelman because I was going to make a push for it. I traded for him the game that he played. Was Philly. it Philly? Yeah, yeah, the game four. that he played Philly, and he absolutely exploded, and then he got, like, turfed up. Yeah, and then he exploded, and he was yeah. just laying down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, needless to say, I did not make the playoffs in that league. But I'm still all in on Adams uh, going into this year. He's another guy where he's very low bust potential. Um, you know, Aaron Rodgers loves him, right? Like, at the end of the day, when you're a veteran quarterback, especially when you're old and not so good anymore, you're going to trust the guys that kind of got you there. So he's just going to feed Adams targets, and that's kind of what I want to see, right? So – Adams is comfortably in my wide receiver three ranking, I believe. Um, but what, what, what are your thoughts on Adams? Yeah, me as well. And on top of that, like Aaron Rodgers loving him. Aaron Rodgers is old, sure. And you can say you're worried about the next quarterback. Deshaun Kaiser and Brett Hundley were throwing this dude passes, and he was still a touchdown monster. A little sneaky fact, Devonta Adams has two seasons in his career with 997 receiving yards, so he just can't break that 1K. <laughs> but I was surprised looking back and seeing how many years in a row this guy has been fantastic. If you were to ask me, I would say maybe two or three. It's been like four, almost, I'm not sure if it's five, I think like four years where he's been a top five uh, like wide receiver in the NFL, and he's still in his prime with a quarterback that may be leaving his prime, but despite that, he's still putting up you know, wide receiver one weeks, week in, week out. He battled that injury, but down the stretch, he was still very, very good, very, very fantasy relevant. My return that I would want for him is the 101 and the 108. So a package of like C.D. Lamb and Jonathan Taylor. Again, he's somebody that I'm not going out and trying to sell. I agree with you. He's also my wide receiver three behind uh, the guy we're going to talk about in two spots, Tyreek Hill. I just think he is he gives you so much upside week to week with also a solid floor, somebody who at the end of the season is going to have 130 plus targets. Yeah, definitely. Next up, I think this is the one wide receiver where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're both comfortable testing the markets with, and that's Mm -hmm. um, DeAndre Hopkins. And that's not to say we think DeAndre Hopkins is bad, but typically when you transition offenses as a wide receiver, there's that like lag and delay because you need to develop the chemistry, learn a new playbook. And Nuke is a lot more experienced than your typical wide receiver, so he probably picks up a lot faster, but there's a little bit of a risk there. And also it's just like, you know, like he's he's definitely getting to that age side like he's we say this like it's a bit contradicting because we say like you know Keenan Allen should buy and he's 28 and Nuke is the same age but like when you look at like the top primo assets like Nuke when he kind of hits like 28 29 you're getting into that Julio range right because Julio at 27 was kind of at the spot where you could say like hey do I sell for max value or do I just like ride him out and if you chose to ride him out chances are you're riding him out for the rest of the career right so you kind of want to give yourself that flexibility yeah, I completely agree with you. A guy like Adams, who's a slightly bit younger than uh, Devontae, or DeAndre Hopkins, still has the potential to increase his value next year. What are the chances, even if DeAndre Hopkins puts up 1,400 yards next year at age, what, 29, 30, is he really going to be any higher than the dynasty wide receiver three? Can he push ahead of Michael Thomas or Adams or whoever else moves ahead of him this year? I don't think so. That's why I'm willing to test the market, similar to a guy like Ezekiel Elliott. What I would want in return, I put 102 here just because that is a tier for me, the 101 and 102. And I also Mm -hmm. added the 201. So something like DeAndre Swift and like a Justin Jefferson, maybe he's somebody that you think is a bit safer because of his ability to play in the slot and the speed that he showed at the combine. Maybe even a Henry Ruggs. Like I wouldn't hate that if Henry Ruggs is like a top 15 pick. If he goes to Philly and you can get a Henry Ruggs and you can get a DeAndre Swift or maybe even a Taylor if a quarterback goes 101 for you, I think that's plenty of a return for a guy like DeAndre Hopkins. And we said it way early in the video, how deep the wide receiver position is. I was looking at Michael Gallup's numbers this year. And if you pace him out to a full season, the only thing he lagged behind Hopkins in was receptions. And sure, that's huge. But, like, you can get a guy like that in the eighth round who is mm-hmm. split apart by, what, like 20, uh, 20 points at the end of the year in a half PPR league. Like, yeah. that is huge value. And if you get a running back in return with these rookie picks, 
Not that I say that it's it's a smash play, but I think selling on a receiver before their value starts to tank, like a Julio Jones when he hit 31, even though he was still very valuable, uh, I think that's the move in Dynasty. Yeah, yeah, I have it. I have it very similar to you. I'm taking the 101 or the 102 plus like any 20, 20 second that gets the job done. I know Nick in uh, in the first inaugural BDG startup league, he actually dealt uh, DeAndre Hopkins just for the 101 straight up, and I I think he might have even added like something like he added I think like it was Royce Freeman. Freeman or something. Yeah. He added Royce Freeman, which obviously doesn't doesn't mean much, but still, it's something. So that's kind of how we view it there. And yeah, it's a little you, less you, than what we say we would get, give up in return, but I'm I'm fine with that as well. If you yeah. Jonathan Taylor for Nuke, who you know startup price right now, Jonathan Taylor is going like early second, and Hopkins yeah. going late first. I mean, think about it next year. What are the chances that Taylor goes back and Hopkins goes up from there? It's probably gonna be neck and neck, or Jonathan Taylor is higher. So that's a good investment for me. Yeah. Next up, our wide receiver uh, two in Dynasty, Tyreek Hill. Um, you know, I have him there because I think he's just, he's like, first of all, he's younger and he's tied to Patrick Mahomes, right? And they, they signed him to a contract. The only reason why I don't have him higher is because he's a freaking idiot. And you know, at any given time, he could like do something stupid and just get banned from the league. Hey, Michael Thomas has those Twitter fingers too. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Fortunately, Michael Thomas doesn't have any history with domestic violence. So, uh, that's, that's a, a fair point, Mike. <laughs> risk, risk is a little bit lower. But uh, yeah, he's just, I mean, he's great, right? People, I think people forgot about him. And the thing is, we've seen him have wide receiver one overall upside already, right? And that was just a year ago. And this year he got hurt um, and what have you. But for me, it just like, it hasn't really changed much in terms of my view for him. So I would like, it's very similar to him and Adams. They're in the same tier for me, but it would take like two top four or five picks for me to think about moving on from Tyreek Hill. Yeah, my return that I would want is basically the same as Adam. So I'd want the 101, but I would also want the 107. So a little bit lower than you, but just basically the top of that. It's the fourth tier for me. The guys like Jalen Rager, Lamb, and those mm-hmm. types. So I think that's a pretty good investment. He's somebody that I'm not trying to sell just because, as you said, he is young and he's paired with the best quarterback in the league. Both of them in their primes is a scary, scary thing. It's like Tyler Lockett and Wilson to like a much, much higher degree. And you know you want that stack as well. So yeah, he's somebody I'm not trying to sell. And I think the next guy as well, I was surprised that he's the 105, uh, Juju yeah. Smith-Schuster. I, every draft I've seen, he's going like a round and a half later than Chris Godwin. So I don't know how the hell he fell to the wide receiver five or he rose to the wide receiver five in these rankings. But either way, we'll break it down. I would personally need the 102 and the 205 in return. I think he's kind of similar to DeAndre Hopkins. And I put out a tweet saying Juju Smith-Schuster did the same stuff that A.J. Brown, that D.J. Moore, and that Chris Godwin did but at a younger age. And people were like upset about that, but it's true. This guy is a big slot receiver who, you know, you could say he's reliant on QB play and you can point at this past year for the reason about that, but he had a toe injury. He had a core injury. He had a concussion. He had a knee injury. Like there were so many confounding variables. His quarterback was getting bonked in the head. The other one was more interested in shooting ducks in his backyard. Like he had nothing working for him. And Deontay Johnson is a very good receiver. Uh, James Washington stepped up. So he did take not a back seat to those guys, maybe statistically, but, I have no doubt that he's the wide receiver one on this team. He is so good after the catch, and that's something that is just being left out. He doesn't need incredible quarterback play to be very good. Even the third week this past year when Big Ben wasn't there, I think he housed like a 77-yard touchdown or something ridiculous. The volume volume wasn't there, but the argument I'm making for him compared to Chris Godwin is – you know, Tom Brady has, what, two years left in the league? Big Ben probably has the same. So what's, what's really the difference between those guys? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in Juju Smith-Schuster. And, you know, I have a lot of him because when you draft Juju Smith-Schuster last year, like it really opens up your draft in terms of like what you can do. Um, and I think this year, you know, he's a great buy candidate. For me, if I had to sell him, though, I'd be looking for a 1.04, which is basically that end of the first tier where we might get a nice running back or a quarterback, depending on how your draft goes plus a late 2020 first or just any 2021 first. So that's kind of how I view it. Like I still view him as a very elite asset. And I think people are just, you know, it's a lot of recency bias kicking in, right? Because we just saw AJ Brown do good, DK Metcalf do good. And we kind of forget that like Juju Smith-Schuster kind of did those things for like two years in a row and at a much younger age. So I'm definitely a buyer for Juju Smith-Schuster. Yeah, and I've heard that wide receiver competition is actually a bad thing. So uh, yeah, Antonio (laughs) Brown being there was actually better for Juju Smith-Schuster to compete for targets than when he was gone and having everything for himself. I'm not mad, I promise. Uh, (laughs) So going off of that, We're going to be jumping into the top 12 rookie picks. Now, I know we have tiers, so you can use that to maybe buy in a guy a little bit lower with a higher pick in the tier or vice versa. I don't know how to word it, but I think think that kind of made sense. Um, 
So we're going to go one for one who we would buy with the pick, who we give up the pick for to get, and who we would give up the – what player we would give up to get the pick in return. So, Mike, what do you have for the 101? What would you buy with that pick? What would you give up the 101 for? Yeah, so I already did this in the league, but I gave up the 101 to get Joe Mixon. And, you know, guys like Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, like Nick Chubb, that tier of that tier of running backs, I'm trying to target. Even if I have to add a little bit something extra, I'm totally happy doing it. And then on top of that, I also added Deshaun Watson because I think his price is just absolutely tanking, and I get it. He doesn't have Nuke anymore, but Watson is still an incredible talent. So He I'm, still has his legs, right? Like, yeah. Hopkins yeah, is on, but you can still move. Like, yeah, he can still and he's move. got Randall Cobb. Like, it's, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, me as well. I have Joe Mixon, Nick Chubb, and I also have Dak Prescott. So I think I'm a little bit higher on Dak than just slightly because we have him the next year than you do. He's currently my quarterback four in Dynasty. I just think if I can get an elite quarterback like that in a super flex league or just a running back who we hope the ceiling for Jonathan Taylor is a Nick Chubb, why not just get the proven guy who's in an offense that now wants to run the ball? Joe Mixon hasn't been incredible but he's still been extremely good for fantasy we hope joe, uh, joe burrow wants to dump off the ball more to him if they do choose him at the 101 so that's what i would buy with the pick uh what i would sell to get the pick if i had amari cooper who i am getting higher on if i could sell him for the 101 i would probably do that straight up just get a guy like jonathan taylor and hopefully that his value rises more than cooper's does now with mccarthy there maybe cooper does become like a top three top five dynasty wide receiver so there is a little bit of risk but i wanted to put realistic ones in here like i could obviously say kenny galladay and you're like yeah no shit noah but like amari <laughs> cooper i'd be willing to sell for the 101 yeah and we cover this a little bit but i'd be willing to explore selling deandre hopkins you know especially if you're in like a rebuild and you might get a little bit more but if you had to do it straight up you know i'd be fine with that as well Yep. Moving to the 102, I have Godwin, uh, Watson, and Juju Smith-Schuster, who we just covered. Basically, same type of tier of guys like Dak, Prescott, and Deshaun Watson aren't too far apart for me. These wide receivers, I'm a little bit lower on wide receivers in Dynasty so I, than running backs, so that's why I have Godwin and Juju below and Mixon and Chubb, but basically the same value. And then what I would sell to get the pick, I put Carson Wentz here. I know in a Dynasty league that might not be like common consensus, and I'm not going out and selling Carson Wentz. But if somebody wants to give me the 102 for him, I'm fine with that. Like, I don't think Joe Burrow is a hell of a lot worse than he is. And he has the weapons surrounding him in uh, Cincinnati for the Bengals. So, yeah, I'm not uh, completely opposed to selling wins for the 102. Yeah, I mean, I kind of got very similar players. I got Chubb and Dak here. I got Chubb slightly below Mixon and Kamara just because of the, the receiving upside. And, you know, Dak and Watson really are just interchangeable for me. So you can kind of, like, play around with how you want to see fit. But for the sell, I have Josh Allen here. And... Uh, this might not be a popular one. I know like Bill's Mafia loves him and Twitter loves him. And, you know, he's got great rushing upside and all that stuff. Um, but I'm still, I still have some question marks regarding his like longevity and not because of injury risk, but his longevity as like a passer because he's yeah, just, an actual like, NFL starting quarterback. Yeah, like objectively <laughs> speaking, like he's just not very good as a passer. And I own him. Like I, I loved having him on my, on my team because he was like rushing for like a touchdown every other game. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, like, if you don't become a proficient passer in the long run, I'm not sure like how long you can really last. Yeah, I'm worried about that too. Uh, I'm worried about that as well with Daniel Jones. With Josh Allen, now that they have Stephon Diggs there, I don't know if he doesn't improve as a passer this year with Diggs, with John Brown, with all the weapons that they do have now. Like, Not that they want to move on from him, but I wouldn't be so sure that they don't have a better chance of winning without Josh Allen at that point. That might be crazy because they did make the playoffs with him, but like, He's, I don't know, I just don't think he is a great real-life quarterback for fantasy. Sure, every week he's like a top six to eight option because we can do with his legs. But if you want to sell on him and get like a Joe Burrow in return who could have similar, maybe not the same ceiling, rushing upside on the ground while also being a very good passer for what we've seen at the college level, the 102, I'd be fine with that return. Yeah. Uh, so the next 103, 104 is kind of our next tier. Just to remind you, we had Joe Burrow and Tua Togavailoa uh, in that. And, you know, what do you got here, Noah, for the buys? Yeah, so 103, this is also a tier. So I would buy Josh Jacobs with the 103. I just a good one. I really like Josh Jacobs. 104, this is something that I actually did. I'm not really advising it because now looking back, I'd probably rather have the 104, but I sold it for Aaron Jones, and I was in a win-now mode, so I don't think that's terrible right there. Uh, what I would sell them for, or what I would sell to get the pick, uh, I would sell Kenny G for the 103. I'm higher on him than you are, but you have him a little bit below at the 104, so I guess we're not too far apart. And I would sell the 104, or I'd sell Daniel Jones for the 104. Same thing with Josh Allen. I'm just not sure, so sure about his longevity as a passer in the league. And I think just 
Burrow and Tua are objectively better prospects and better players. And if they get starting jobs, I think they're going to be more fantasy relevant than Jones, who is a very good fantasy quarterback. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. And, you know, I I kind of pivoted and really like Daniel Jones. But, you know, if you can sell for the 104, I'm 100% on board because I would definitely take one of these tier one, tier two guys over him. Yeah, um, I mean, this guy's like he's a new Jameis Winston, right? He doesn't he doesn't throw interceptions, but he fumbles like literally every other time. I think he had twenty two total total turnovers yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, no, he had like twenty two fumbles. Oh, maybe <laughs> that on top of his interception, he had like something like thirty to forty like over total turnovers. So definitely not sustainable. I'm actually a little bit higher on Wentz. I think I got Juju Smith Schuster for the one hundred three, OBJ for the one hundred four, and Carson Wentz uh, for the one hundred four. I, I like Wentz. Uh, I think, you know, he kind of did what he could with what he had. And I'm expecting them to add some weapons. I'm expecting Alshon Jeffrey to come back. Uh, hopefully, the John Jackson is back. So, I think he's got some pretty decent upside. And if you need a quarterback in Superflex, that's someone I'd definitely be willing to pull the trigger on. And the reason why I have Juju smith Schuster and OBJ out here is because, you know, I'm assuming that I can take a couple of the running backs ahead of them. Uh, but I'm definitely taking them both over all of the rookie wide receivers. Like, that's a no-brainer for me, right? And then, in terms of sells... I'd be exploring and happily take like a 103 for someone like AJ Brown because on the off chance I can flip that into like a DeAndre Swift and Jonathan Taylor at running back. And then at 104, I'm definitely willing to sell Kenny G. Uh, I might even be willing to sell him at 105, to be honest. Yeah, th- yeah, Kenny G I'm very high on as well. I like what he did in the face of having terrible quarterback play, but if you can get a top quarterback or a top running back in return for him, yeah, I you can't really go wrong in there because if you think about it, in terms of startup pick value, he's like a fourth round pick. And these guys are going in and around like mid to late seconds. So you could always just flip that pick for somebody greater than Kenny G in the long run as well. Yep. 105. Uh, this is where we have Cam Akers. And it uh, looks like you got, you got OBJ here, right? You're a little yeah, bit I have OBJ, OBJ at 105. Me. And then 106, it's the same tier. So I think OBJ, A-Rob, Mark Andrews, and Eckler are all in and around the same conversation for me. What I would sell to get the 105 I have Kelsey for the 105 just because I think his value is a little bit higher than where it should be because I would prefer Mark Andrews in a dynasty league. And if I could sell for the 105 and then buy Mark Andrews with it or something like that and just upgrade by doing nothing, basically, I'm fine with that. I would also sell Derrick Henry for the 105. I know I'm always talking about selling Derrick Henry. And every <laughs> time I say it, I've been wrong, but I promise you this may or may not be the time that I'm right. Uh, and then for the 106, I would sell Leonard Fournette because it's the same thing. They're not picking up his fifth-year option, I don't believe. Uh, and even if they do, it's not a great situation. He was giving up all the opportunities in the world to succeed this year. He was healthy. He was being used in the passing game. And he just wasn't realistically a great fantasy option. Like, sure, he gave you that floor. But I want somebody to score me touchdowns. And I want somebody who, at least like they have 100 targets, they're being like a top five running back in the league in terms of fantasy value. And he just wasn't that last year. So I don't see how his value could increase. Yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely worried about him. I mean, Jacksonville is basically selling off defensive assets like hotcakes. And, you know, I fully expect them to add weapons on the outside this year. And we can kind of see that same trend that happened to Zeke where you added Amari Cooper, you brought in Randall Cobb, and Zeke's targets like went down because you have better pass catchers available, right? And Fournette's by no means a pass catching weapon. So when other guys come in, they're going to earn those targets ahead of him. Uh, I have a couple other buys in here. I have someone like Corton Sutton at 105. Again, just comes down to the fact that I would rather have him than every single rookie wide receiver. Uh, and then I got A-Rob at 106. I just, I just love A-Rob, man. Like, I think he's like incredibly undervalued. And again, I would take him ahead of every single rookie wide receiver. And then a more sneaky buy. I have, I have Jared Goff here. And uh, in Superflex, I think, he's a, I think people are really down on Goff. You know, they think he had like a pretty bad year, which he did. But he still put up like 4,600 yards, right? So as a QB2... He's a little bit boom bust, but every single QB2 is boom bust, right? And Jared Goff is way less boom bust than Aaron Rodgers. And for some reason, he's going like 10 spots lower. So uh, I'm willing to test the markets here with Todd Gurley gone. I think they're going to be, you know, passing a lot. So I'm always looking for that like Goff Higby stack. I think it's a pretty cheap and cost efficient stack to get in Dynasty these days. And similar to you, I got Henry as a sell, Fournette as a sell, um, and I got Aaron Rodgers as a sell. If you can get a 106 for Aaron Rodgers, I think that's a pretty good return. And and in turn, probably trying to flip that for someone like uh, Jared Goff or even a Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, realistically, A-Rod hasn't been that good in the past three or four years for fantasy. So if you can ship that off for somebody who might be a Cam Akers or a J.K. Dobbins, or if somehow a quarterback falls, that's that's a huge win in my books. Moving on to the next tier, uh, the 107, I cannot see right now. I think it's J- Jalen Rager for me. Yeah. Uh, I would much rather have a Diggs or Sutton than a Rager because what you said earlier, like I'd rather somebody who is established in the league. Maybe Diggs is a little bit 
sneaky like to move down because he's switching teams but like a Cortland Sutton I'd probably even take the I'd sell the 106 for him probably but I just put him the 107 because he is an established player who also did really well in the face of terrible quarterback play last year I'm super high on him uh, what I'd buy with the 108 I really like Keenan Allen uh, I know I'm a Chargers fan so that might sound biased but I just think what he's done these past three years and he's just been a really good safety blanket even if and God forbid it's Justin Herbert like they're not going to not throw to Keenan Allen because Justin Herbert has a big arm. He's a huge part of their offense. He is very good. Phil Rivers sucked last year. He was still very good. Uh, the 109, I'd be willing to buy Kenyon Drake and Calvin Ridley, two guys that I think are going to have massive 2019s. Obviously, Ridley has the longer shelf life, but with Austin Hooper gone, I think his value is super high. And at the 110, I would be willing to buy a guy like Devin Singletary because I'm not so sure his role would be too much different. Maybe the pass run split would be different than Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but I think the the snap share will be very similar. And if Singletary does maintain the number one job in Buffalo, I'd probably prefer him than wherever Clyde Edwards Hilaire would land. And I'd also buy Devontae Parker for that price. I like Chan Gailey there. I think what he did with Ryan Fitzmagic and Josh Rosen is pretty good. If they get Tua Tagovailoa, I'm all over him. And then what I would sell those picks for, or what I would sell to get those picks, 107, Julio Jones, just getting off on him as I, while I still can. Cooper Cup for the 108. Uh, Darren Waller for the 109 and Carrie Ann Johnson for the 109 and then 110 Todd Gurley and Melvin Gordon two guys who are just on the back half of their career yeah that, that's uh, that's interesting I'm, I'm pretty similar to you the one flip I have is you have Singletary as a buy at 1.10 uh, and I have Singletary as a sell at 1.09 for me like I think Singletary is a good player uh, I think there's just a, just like a lot of question marks there um, in terms of like who they're going to bring in. He obviously faded the biggest bullet by fading uh, Melvin Gordon because that would have been disastrous. But, you know, we still have to fade a couple bullets on the rookie side, so we'll see what happens. Uh, I also love Ridley as a buy, you know, similar to, you know, the concept of like just – I have him basically behind every single uh, – ahead of every single rookie wide receiver except uh, maybe C.D. Lamb. You know, he's he's someone where like you're you're not getting like a top five wide receiver ever, I think, but – you're kind of getting that perennial like fringe, like low end, uh, mid to low wide receiver one to high wide receiver two. And that's an incredibly valuable asset. So I really love him there. And then the other one I have in here, I think is DK Metcalf. Um, he's someone that's really grown on me. Uh, very young, put up a great rookie season, tied to a great quarterback, although tied to an cr- extremely bad offensive, uh, co- offensive coordinator and coach. But I love the talent. And then the other one I have is Ryan Tannehill. So I think Tannehill is still incredibly undervalued. You know, people love to talk about Derrick Henry and how good he was for the offense. But if we look at efficiency wise, like that offense picked up and started running really well when Tannehill stepped in, right? You know, Derrick Henry was there from the beginning of the year and he wasn't doing anything with Mariota and Tannehill really opened up that passing offense. So I love him tied to uh, AJ Brown. Yeah. And on top of that, he didn't even use his legs all that much last year. And we know that he has that in his arsenal. So if he starts to run just a little bit more and he's been sneakily a very good fantasy weapon or fantasy quarterback for the past few years, even playing in Miami. So yeah, I'm, I'm all over Tannehill. He got signed, he got extended and I'm not so sure that they just go through this off season without adding more weapons. And even if that hurts AJ Brown, that'll help Tannehill having more mouths to feed there. Johnny Smith taking a step forward. Hopefully they get somebody out of the backfield that has hands. Sorry for all this Derrick Henry slander, but yeah, I'm, I'm all over Ryan Tannehill as well. I also see that you have Terry McLaurin as a sell. So Danny, close your ears. I would agree with that as well, because I'd much rather have a CD lamb over him. Even a Jalen Rager who I have ahead of CD lamb. I, I don't know. I just, I, I like their talent. I like their profile. I guess I'm not a huge analytics guy, but I think if the draft capital is there, I don't think that they're going to be much worse fantasy assets than what a McLaurin is, especially playing. Yeah. And like, what can you re- like, obviously did really well this year, but they're probably going to add more weapons. We were talking about it in the discord. Their second leading receiver was Chris fucking Thompson. Like, <laughs> it's going to be better than that. Like Steven Sims was their third leading receiver. So the chances that they add somebody better than Chris Thompson, I think is like 99%. So he might take a step forward as an actual player, but for fantasy output, the chances that his, output actually increases i'm not so sure is that high yeah i mean uh for me it's like if he succeeds and i honestly i hope he succeeds i never really root against a player unless it's kellen balage because he's fucking trash but I think it, he as long as not, too he ducks when the ball comes as well yeah as long as it's not kellen balage like i i truly root for players to succeed and if he does succeed he will be the ultimate outlier of outliers there is no one that you can really comp him to if michael thomas us uh, except he can't, yeah, not even Michael Thomas, because Michael Thomas still broke out and dominated in his senior year. But yeah, there's just no one to comp him to. And you know, in leagues where I do have McLaurin, I kind of took him. I think in that like 
late second to early third, uh, just based on draft capital. So if I can flip him for a mid first uh, this time around and grab someone like a CD Lamb and kind of extend that uh, extend that value chain where like I have like more time uh, before his because because if McLaurin busts this year, his price will tank. Like there is like yeah, everyone, everybody that was saying he was going to bust yeah. and then he does bust. It's like, okay, this guy was a fluke. What can I really get in return? Now we're not saying yeah. he's going to bust and it's a lock for it. But if it does happen, like the whole point of this exercise is to try to negate risk. And by yeah. selling a McLaurin while he may be at or around his peak, sure he could get better, but getting the one Oh, what the one Oh five, one Oh six for him. Yeah. Uh, you're getting basically a return on the ceiling that McLaurin may have instead of yeah. waiting a year and then getting the floor of him. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's kind of why I have him here. I also have uh, Gordon and Gurley to sell. So if you're looking to sell those guys, I hear a lot of questions like, hey, I'm not a contender. What can I sell Gurley for? What can I sell Gordon for? I'd be targeting that like late mid section of picks if you can get that. That'd be a solid return for those guys. Yeah, the fact that Gurley got a one-year deal just does not inspire any confidence. So after this year is up, what's the chances that he gets a longer deal than one more year? And Melvin Gordon, the same thing. I think he's 27 right now. A two-year yeah. deal, he's going to be 29 when he's off of that. Like, his value isn't going to get any higher, especially with Philip Lindsay back there, who is a very good running back and is going to earn touches in that backfield. Yeah, and then I think the last one I have, which you don't have, is uh, Evan Ingram. I think this is someone that, like, obviously there's an injury risk, right? But when he's on the field, he is a baller. Like, if you told me that, you know, it's kind of like that Will Fuller argument, but if you told me that Evan Ingram would play 16 games, I would easily have him in the same tier as Kittle. I'm not saying he's as good of a player, but from a fantasy perspective, he's like that level of player. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to get him at a discount. And I think in Dynasty, people typically don't value tight ends as much because they're like, oh, we only need to start one of them. But in Dynasty, like you only have like six startable weekly tight ends. So if you have one of them, like that's a big roster and like starting uh, lineup advantage. Yeah, I'm definitely a little bit lower than you on Engram. He'd probably be in this 111 to 112 tier for what I would be willing to give up to get him. But yeah, like you said, even last year when he had to switch quarterbacks, I know he wasn't quite as dominant with Daniel Jones in there, but he still had some pretty big games. Obviously, that chemistry is going to build, and he is, when he's on the field, a top two or three tight end for fantasy purposes. He's like a Mark Andrews, but you know he's, he's getting pepper with the targets every single week. So yeah, he's basically another receiver in your tight end spot, somebody you can trust week in and week out. Again, if he was guaranteed to be healthy, I would move him up into maybe that purple tier for what I'd be willing to give up because he's around Andrews when he's on the field. Yeah. Um, last tier we have here, the 1.1 to 1.12, uh, why don't you go over? I think we have a lot of similarities here actually. Yeah. So 111, I'd be willing to sell it for a guy like Woods or Thielen. Everybody is kind of off Thielen. They maybe jumped up a little bit more when Diggs left, but the guy is like 29 years old. He doesn't have that much tread on his tires because he didn't enter the league or he wasn't a big part of the Vikings for a while. So I think he could easily have like two or three more seasons as a very high end wide receiver too. Like for redraft purposes this year, I'm not so sure I wouldn't rank him as a wide receiver one just because of the volume that's going to be there and what he's shown. So I like him. I really like Robert Woods. What he did down the stretch was very, very incredible, very uh, impressive. Uh, and the fact that they're running more two tight end sets and he was still on the field gives me a lot of hope for him. What I would sell, uh, a, what player I would sell to get the 111 would be a James Conner. Now the the chances that they draft a rookie running back, I know there's a lot of blurbs talking about it, but we covered it in past weeks. It's not very high with the type of picks that they have and the holes that they have on their team, which aren't many, but I doubt that they would want to spend on a running back. So James Conner could very well be a very good fantasy asset this year, but I'm just a little bit worried about that health and the longevity there. And I always want to get out on running backs before their value tanks. And then for the 112, who I'd be willing to buy with it, Le'Veon Bell, maybe he has one or two years left. This might be a bit of a stretch, but he was still, I think, the RB16 last year with yep. nothing working for him. Like Luke Falk, Trevor Simeon, Adam Gase's guys, eyes going everywhere except looking at Le'Veon Bell. Like yeah. it was a complete shit show. Also, Nikhil Harry, somebody who I think if he does, you know, if he puts up like 800, 900 yards this year, his value is going to skyrocket. And then also a sneaky buy would be a Cam Newton in a super flex league. Mike, we talked about it earlier, but like what are the chances that you, that Cam Newton is a starter week one this year? Like what would you put that at? Week one? Um, I mean, definitely over 50. Over 50%. Like, you're getting, when he's on the field, he's a QB1. Yeah. Maybe not this past year, but a QB1 with rushing upside for the 112. I'm taking that every single day uh, for who I'm selling to get the 112. It would be T.Y. Hilton. Same thing, older receiver who's been a bit banged up, or he was banged up last year. He always seems to be like a game time decision every single year in play, but I'd be willing to get off of him before his value starts to tank. Yeah, yeah. Robert Woods it continues to be the most disrespected high receiver 
in fantasy. Like this guy finished on a points per game basis as the wide receiver 12 last year, the wide receiver 17 the year before, and he's going as the wide receiver 30. He's going as a wide receiver three. And this is what we mean when we say like the wide receiver depth is a uh, class is so deep. Like you can get wide receiver one production for wide receiver 30 prices. And that's like, like the 95 and a half percent of Keenan Allen. Yeah. And Keenan Allen's like what wide receiver 15 in dynasty. Yeah, exactly. And we love Keenan Allen too, but like, I in like in all these best balls I've been doing, I've literally just been copping the smash on Robert Woods every single time in like the sixth, seventh round, even if I had to reach one round because he's just worth it, right? And another guy I have in here, Golson's going 105. <laughs> yeah, dude, that was insane. Um, I also have Devontae Parker. You have Devontae Parker a little bit higher. The only reason why I have him lower here is because I think you can get him for cheaper. Uh, I don't think you need to pay like Ridley Singletary prices for Parker because based on what I've seen in startups, he's still going in like the ninth, 10th rounds, which is like pretty ridiculous considering like, you know, what he did last year. And, you know, I was the biggest Parker hater like ever. Right. And I think the real big turning point for me is watching him go up against Stefan Gilmore and just taking the league's best defensive back and making him look like a clown. Uh, on on the prime stage so that was a big turning point for me and obviously having Fitzpatrick there is a huge help because that guy just unloads on wide receivers he's a fantasy gold mine for any wide receiver so I love him there again Harry's my boy so I'm always going to be willing to cop the buy button on 112 and this might become a surprise to any of you that follow me but I think David Montgomery is an okay buy it for a late first you know he wasn't fantastic last year but man like that guy got put in like the shittiest situation ever right like with Matt Nagy calling some just like straight up awful, awful play calling. And then one of the worst O-lines in the, in the league. I, I would like, I went through this thought exercise. Like, what do you, do you think Miles Sanders or Devil Sing- Devin Singletary would have done any better in David Montgomery's shoes? Probably not because the pass catching work would have still went to Tariq, uh, Tariq Cohen there. The offensive line wasn't good. We know the offensive line in Philly is much better. We know that the bills aren't as elite as Philly, but they're still very good. So yeah, I like that pick there. The offensive line is still kind of shit, but you know, at the one twelve. Guys like Zach Moss might be around there, and I'll take David Montgomery over Zach Moss any day, at least at this point, because we know at least where he's at. Maybe Zach Moss lands on the Chargers, and he's just like the 1B to Eckler's 1A. So at least at least we know the role that Monty has. He still put up like 1,100 yards in that situation. Maybe they fix the quarterback play. Maybe they put Foles back there, and it's not so bad for them. Uh, so, yeah, I'd be willing to buy him at the 112. I think that's a pretty good investment looking at the other guys like a T Higgins around there, like even a Denzel Mims. I'd be willing to bet on a running back like Monty improving his value ahead of a wide receiver in their rookie year, improving it. Yeah. And as a sell here, I got Michael Hardman. I think it might be a little bit tougher sell, but I'm saying to sell him like forever now. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know, like people just, people love the Patrick Mahomes attachment. I love it too, but I love it for Tyreek Hill. I love it for like really good receivers and you know, Hardman is explosive but I think he's like, you know, he's kind of that player where like he's really good for an NFL team, but I'm not so sure that he's going to be a weekly contributor for you in, uh, in fantasy. And like, if anything, like that's what I think of rugs as well. Like I think they're both can be really good players, but just not very good fantasy assets. Yeah. And I'd probably sell him a, like for a lower pick. I'd probably go like two or three, two or four. Oh. You may argue like McCole Hardman isn't a really good offense. Yeah. He wasn't that good offensive last year. And we've seen that the team wants to funnel to Tyreek Hill to Travis Kelsey and to the running back when they have Damian Williams back there. So there are a lot of mouths to feed. There is volume there, but he's probably going to be fourth on the pecking order, no matter what happens if, if Sammy Watkins leaves or not. And I'd be, I'd be more interested in getting maybe a Denzel Mims, a Justin Jefferson, even a Henry Ruggs uh, instead of a Miko Hardman, who I think probably has like an even worse profile than Henry Ruggs coming out. Yeah. Beautiful. That that kind of wraps it up for us in terms of like the one for one players. Hopefully you found that useful. Um, and I just realized that me and you have to immediately go to our leagues and send out some of these offers before we release the episode. Uh, otherwise it's basically a blueprint for how we value players, which, uh, you know, that's the downfall of, uh, that's the sacrifice we make for you guys. Okay. You know, we're not the video comes out Friday. You know why we'll just say that. Yeah. yeah. Like if you send me one of these offers, I will immediately accept it because this is what I actually <laughs> believe. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that helped for you guys. Uh, next up, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna move into the trades. And again, if you want to submit the trades to us and get us to look at them, first of all, we're already doing it. Like 
every day on a weekly basis, like in the discord channel. Um, but if you want to try and get on the episode once in a while, we'll have one of these and you know, you submit your trade to us and we'll kind of evaluate it um, on, on the live stream. Before on we top of that, that, every other month, we also have a Q and a session where we go through you guys questions and we might also do a viewer, a viewer topic for a video. So we get your feedback and talk and research about what you guys want to hear. Probably not this month because the draft is at the end of the month and there's gonna be a ton going on, but we have a lot of stuff going on in the discord completely free. If we don't answer your question, I guarantee like 15 other degenerates <laughs> will. And it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's like a bunch of lemmings just like running to a pile and just answering every question that you have, whether it's how to actually play dynasty football, how to uh, value picks, you get a bunch of opinions. I know you may, I don't want to sound like high and mighty. You may value Mike and my own opinion a little bit higher than a random person on there, but it's good to get a lot of people's different perspectives on there. And we're not any, like, we're not gurus. We don't know like yeah. in depth a ton more than any other, uh, any of you other guys. So getting 15 opinions may be even more valuable than getting just two of ours. So I would, I would highly suggest just joining that and getting multiple perspectives on different deals. Now, if you do join a league through there and you're asking questions, your league mates will probably see it and they'll be like, damn, maybe I shouldn't do this deal because 15 people just told me that the other guy is winning. So there is that downside, but I think it's a pretty good community. It's not that toxic. We talk about stonks. We talk about memes. We just talk about a good time. So Discord, check that out. It'll be linked below and everything. Yeah, it's a great community. I absolutely love that. And I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to be cocky when I say this, but I honestly think it's one of the best dynasty communities around. Um, I love like interacting with people, talking shit and doing all that stuff. So it's a great time. And, you know, another thing is obviously big dogs draft guide is live. Um, I think earlier last week, Nick released an exclusive article talking about the top five 2021 running backs today. I just released an article talking about the top five 2021 wide receivers, you know, everyone's on the 2020 and here we're trying to make sure you're ahead of the game. So we're, we're, part of get 2020. we're on the 2021, <laughs> like Bill Belichick, we're on the 2021. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you cop that big dog draft Uh, just, you know, huge Slash value. MKF uh, for $10. If you are in, I think it's one of 37 states that participates in monkey night fight. You can get both guys for $10. And then I think they match your entry fee into monkey night fight. So you get, I think it's a $70 value. It's, we have a ton of profiles. I think it's like 56 or 58. Yep. We're going to be adding more after the draft. We add, we update rankings like every day or whatever, every week. Uh, we add profiles when new news ar arises. We update them after the draft. It's completely interactive. We will be doing exclusive videos. I think every Monday, I'm not so sure when that's going to start, but we'll be do doing exclusive content to that every week, whether it's a rookie uh, mock draft, whether it's a super flex rookie mock draft, the tight end premium one, just talking about different uh, strategies that you won't see on this channel for 10 bucks. You really can't go wrong. I mean, there's nothing else to really actually, I won't say that, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a pretty good value. There's a lot of stuff in there, but now it's time to move on to the questions that we got from our discord. Yep. And you know, we got a million trades. I probably spent about an hour scrolling through all the fucking trades that people submitted to select them. Uh, if we didn't select a trade, I'm sorry. Uh, you probably didn't like give the format or enough detail we needed, or we just don't like you, but don't take it personally. Yeah, or um, there was like a million of them and it like took forever <laughs> to screenshot this stuff. And we're yeah. like an hour and a half into this video already. So yeah. we love all First, you guys. It's just, we felt that these uh, gave a really good scenario for what we just discussed. There's a lot of rookie picks in these deals. And I think it'll be helpful for you guys. Yeah. First trade up from our boy, Johnny Picos. Side A, uh, Cortland Sutton plus the 1.09. This is a super flex PPR. Versus side B, the 1.1 1 .1 plus the 2.6. And he is a contender. Um, some of the key pieces include Watson, Aaron Jones, Ken Allen, Galladay, Cup, Kirk, Kelsey. And apparently side B needed a QB or RB really, really bad. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think straight up seeing Sutton in 109 for 1.1 1 .1 and 2.6, you'd probably say I'd, I'd rather Sutton. And I don't disagree. I think that's very fair <laughs> value. But when you take into consideration, like, this is why we like doing this. We get to see your guys' roster. We can break it down this way. I'm pretty sure he didn't have, like, any type of quarterback, too, that you could rely on. And the fact that he could, you know, fade those top two running backs, get a Joe Burrow to pair there, getting a starting quarterback and, in turn, losing a Cortland Sutton and, like, a Jerry Judy, when you also have Keenan Allen, Kenny Galladay, Christian Kirk, Cooper Cup, all these names, like, Cortland Sutton was probably starting for you, but the disparity between the crap quarterback that he had and Cortland Sutton, I think you get more points out of Joe Burrow and then moving Christian Kirk into your flex. So I would go with side B. Um, now, this isn't just objective. I would always go with side B in this case. But I think based on team need, based on him wanting to win now, uh, I'd side with the 1-1 one -one side or the 101 side. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And this is why we want to like get the, get the team overview so we can kind of provide this feedback, but like basically like you need, like you have so much depth at wide receiver and you're obviously contender. You have guys like Kelsey and Aaron Jones. So you really want to make that push. And so that's kind of why I would also go uh, with side B. So good trade there for him. Next up, we got our man, the goat video editor, Scott BDGE, the finesser of all startup trades, the commissioner, co-commissioner of the new Filet the Public League. This was a great trade. And, you know, we picked it because it was pretty interesting. So side A, given up the 1.05, the 1.12, and Nicole Hardman. And side B uh, is getting Godwin plus uh, Ward, which is like that practice squad uh, wide receiver on the Philly. I think his name's first name. You mean their wide receiver one? Yeah, yeah, great for wide receiver one, Greg Ward. This is a super flex, half PPR, tight end premium. Not that it's relevant for this trade. And I wrote down here that Scott's team is stacked to the motherfucking tits because this guy has all of the players. Looks like he's playing in the four-person league. I'm not sure. He's got Patrick Mahomes, Dak Prescott, so two top five quarterbacks there. He's got Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara, Miles Sanders, DJ Moore, DeAndre Hopkins. I mean, I'm sick. Yeah. Whoa. Scott, I'm <laughs> sick to my stomach seeing this roster. I can't believe you would do somebody like this. Objectively, it's not a bad trade. But when you say you're giving up like a J.K. Dobbins, whatever 112 is, and Hardman, to be able to add Chris Godwin to that arsenal, like I feel like, what is that, LeBron James? Like it don't matter, this, 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 whatever. I don't care if you give up 1-1. One, one. I don't care if you give up 1-2, one, 1-3. One, Adding Godwin to that squad, you will not yeah. lose next year. That's a big Dude, I, I, I think. I think he actually sold Godwin in this. So I think he actually got the 1.05. Oh, he did? To a Mikkel Hardman. I think so, yeah. Scott, you lost your touch, that. baby. <laughs> that is not a good look. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure, but I think he did. We'll, we'll have to double check on the screenshots. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this one. When you have a roster that stacked, and unless you're starting like 11 to 12 players, and trust me, like I play in those leagues and they're, they're incredibly fucking hard because you're starting like whatever you can. But unless it's a super deep roster, you want to stack the studs, right? Because you're trying to get like as much points as you can. And, you know, I would personally go to Godwin's side and Godwin's not declining in value, regardless of all this talk about like Tom Brady losing his arm and all this. Bullshit. I don't understand that. Chris Godwin plays in the slot. What did he yeah. do with Julian Edelman? He's just a yeah. bigger, faster, probably at this point of his career, much, much better receiver than Julian Edelman. So why yeah. wouldn't he be good in these next two years with Tom Brady under center? Probably at every point in his career, he's better than Julian Edelman. Let's, let's not pretend here. Like Godwin's an incredible talent. So yeah. if you can get that guy, that's a cornerstone wide receiver to build your roster around. And because you have guys like Nuke, who's kind of declining in value, if you get a Godwin, right, you could flip that. You could flip the under Hopkins for like a one one and add like a Jonathan Taylor to the roster. So I really love side B on this as well. Uh, Scott, like hopefully you got side B. Yeah, I would go with side B. Scott, if you did make this trade and you gave up Godwin, I joke about this all the time. Please send me an offer because I, I, I want that. I want that in my t- I want that on my team. If I can do that, I'm all over it. We'll get back to the show now. But Scott, I'm not joking. Send me an offer. <laughs> Next up, uh, we got our man FF Medio Crates. I don't know what that means, but that's his name. And this is an interesting one because this is where this is an example where you someone overpaid but got a player that made their team better. So he gave up the 1.07. The 2.01, the 2021 first, his 2021 first, which will probably be a late pick, and his 2021 second for Josh Jacobs. This is a single QB, half PPR format. And again, I just wrote down his team is stacked to the motherfucking tits. He's got Mixon, Drake, Julio, Adams, Kittle, uh, DK Metcalf, DJ Chark, 101 and 103. Um, so, you know, if, for me in this type of scenario, like, I'm of the belief that you don't have to win every trade as long as you're not taking like a fat L on every single trade you do. And obviously that's not happening here because his team is incredibly stacked. So if you're missing that like workhorse running back, there's only like eight to 10 of them, right? These guys aren't falling off trees and it's a huge advantage to have them. And if you're contending, I'm at first I was like, man, that's a lot to give up. But when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, like maybe I'd be okay with giving that up because it kind of makes my team better. Like, what do you think? Yeah, and seeing that it's a one quarterback, I didn't notice that at first. We're talking 107. That's like a Jerry Judy. So looking at these picks, it would be like, you know, Jerry Judy, uh, Justin Jefferson, and then two picks next year. When you put players to those names, it was super flex would be a little bit different because you might be able to get an acres there. But like those names and you can get a, a running back who we both, I believe, have in and around our top 10 for Dynasty. And adding that to that stable of running backs that you already have, while also having Adams, Kittle, DK, Chark, and the 101 being able to add something else like a Jonathan Taylor, sure, it's an overpay, but you're able to not only win now, but you have a bunch of young assets to set you up for the future. So I'm completely fine 
losing on your little trade calculator and being able to to be competitive for the next five to 10 years. Maybe Jacobs in 10 years isn't in the league, but still the next five years, he's going to be like 27 at the end of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine overpaying if you're getting somebody that is not only young, but we've seen production out of them and yeah. Jacobs has done both. This is what we mean by like trade calculators. Like if you put this in a trade calculator, it's a landslide in the picks, right? But what you have to think about is like Jacobs has a lockdown workhorse role. He's like 22 years old, right? What happens if you draft 107 and you draft like, you know, I love Jalen Rager, but let's say you draft Jalen Rager and he busts. There's one, that's one of the top assets gone. And then the 2021 first, if you're really contender, it's probably a later first. What happens if you draft another wide receiver that year and he busts, right? You're sitting on, you know, you're sitting on like things that you hope are really good. And I get it. Like if, if you were, if this was a rebuild, it'd be a no brainer. I would definitely go with the pick side because you need as many darts as you can, right? You want to hit on guys like DK and AJ Brown and hope that happens. But if you're a contender, like you want proven guys that are scoring you points. And that's like kind of how I think about this trade. Yeah. And if we were just to put a number behind Josh Jacobs, we, I think I already did it earlier, but like the 103 in a one quarterback league, the 103 for the 107, 201, 220, the 2021 picks. Sure. It might be a loss, but just put context behind everything. Look at the roster and just say, how much better is Jack, Josh Jacobs going to be on my team than probably two guys this year that will never touch my starting lineup. And then I'm going to have to go next year and have two guys that aren't going to touch my starting lineup that year as well. So yeah, I'm completely on board with this. I'm fine to overpay on these type of like Joe Mix and Josh Jacobs, Alvin Kamara, all these type of guys that you know are going to be in your lineup week in and week out, being a, st- a part of that stable that's going to win you a chip. Yep. All right. That wraps it up uh, for the trades. We're going to just quickly jump into this week's narrative. Hit the intro. This week's narrative. The COVID-19 virus is and going to result in canceled OTAs, which is going to significantly impact rookie wide receiver production. What are your thoughts on that? All right. My thoughts initially were that I'm not buying it. Not that I am. See, the way you word it that way, it makes me think differently. If the COVID-19 shuts down everything, preseason and all that, I don't yeah. think wide receivers are at that much of a disadvantage because you have to think that all these veterans, like a Stefan Diggs changing teams, like other Randall Cobb, whatever, that his name is just on my mind, him changing teams, they have to learn new offenses. Teams with new OCs, like the, the Cleveland Browns, like the Miami Dolphins, like the Dallas Cowboys, they also have to learn their offense as well. So obviously rookies without any NFL experience are going to struggle. But at that point, you also have to think about the league as a whole. Gonna, they're going to struggle as well if they're not returning a bunch of assets and a lot of people in the front office or in the coaching staff because – even though that they have this NFL experience, they still have to learn the verbiage of their playbook, the, the continuity of the offensive line, the, the chemistry that they build with a new quarterback. So I think that if, if everything gets canceled, everybody is kind of going to be like all hell is going to break loose. If just OTAs get canceled, then sure, yeah, I think wide receivers are going to take a step back. But I also think that helps a guy like Brian Edwards, uh, which I brought up in a tweet. I think like if, if his broken foot is why you're off of him, he shouldn't be moving that much further down than these other guys who are going to miss just as much time because of this virus and because they're not going to be able to be on the field. So sure, if OTAs and like up until July it's canceled, I don't expect them to return too much value. Maybe that's a, a point where you want to sell them. If it cancels everything, I think the NFL is just going to be a black hole this year. And whoever just returns the most assets and coaching staff is probably going to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, especially the one about uh, Brian Edwards, who's like starting from behind. So like, if you cancel the OTAs, he kind of catches up and like becomes the same level as guys. I didn't even think about that, uh, but that's why I bring the big facts. I personally am a little bit cautious because I think you know rookie wide receivers in general don't really produce. You know, 2019 aside and 2014 aside, they take a lot of time to develop, and I think I think that OTAs are important. Um, tra- I think training camp is definitely important. Um, but, you know, that's kind of why I, I tend to lean running backs in my drafts anyways. So I'm probably going to lean that even more this year. But um, I'm, I'll say that this, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm not really going to count on rookie wide receiver production. So that kind of, take that as you will. Like if you draft a rookie wide receiver, don't go selling after year one because they didn't produce. And if you're not going to draft a rookie wide receiver altogether, I'm totally fine with fading that as well. Yeah, or if you think that this is a real chance that OTAs and training camp gets canceled, sell your 106, your 107, and get the returns that we mentioned earlier to get rid of that risk and get a proven stud who, like uh, Keenan Allen might not be a good example, uh, a Robert Woods, who his surrounding situation is exactly the same. 
and you get somebody who you know is going to be in and around at the top 12 receivers next year, as opposed to somebody who might not build any type of chemistry with their new quarterback, with their new offense, in a completely different league with grown men. So, yeah, I think we kind of came to a consensus. I thought we are going to disagree here, but I think if just the first part of the offseason gets canceled, I'm apprehensive about rookie receivers. If everything gets canceled, who knows what's going to happen. This is like unprecedented and I can't really make any analysis for something that hasn't happened yet. Yep. All right. That's it. That's all we got for you guys. The long ass episode. Hopefully you have some takeaways from it that you can act and hopefully you're not in leagues with me because I'm going to try and make some of these trades. But uh, yeah, if you're not in the league with me, go out there, fire some trades out and see what we can get. All right. Hope you guys enjoy this next week. I think we're going to be breaking down our league if we get far far enough in the league to break down our actual picks trades that went down if not we're probably going to be doing a startup draft type of start draft strategy type of video probably not a mock draft but just looking at player values and stuff like that so hope you guys enjoyed go cop the draft guide go join our discord but that's all we got for you today hopefully this hour and a half head talk was incredible so peace